好，我们很荣幸哈，我们今天呃，在第二天的议程里面，我们请到 James Tauber 作为我们呃一早的 keynote speaker。啊、um, ，James is a long-term web developer, and he has worked on web development for 20 years, and has been investing in Python technology for 15 years. He has involved the development of XML. And he is a core developer of Django, and is a lead developer of Pinex project. He right now, James is the CEO of the company uh, Eldarium, and uh, they are providing hosting service for Django sites. It is our pleasure to have this opportunity to have James here to talk about the, his experience and insights about developing web. Web services by using Python, and uh, uh, his thought, his general ideas about how the web development is. 那么 James 呢，在网页开发技术上面已经投入二十年的时间了，而且有十五年的时间是在写 Python 的。那他曾经参与过 XML 的呃开发计划。啊，那他们，那么他也是 Django 的核心开发人员，也是 Pinex 计划的呃呃首席开发者。啊，那 James 现在是 a l d a r i n 这家 company 的这家公司的 CEO。那这家公司有很有名的 g o n d o l a i o Service， 是一个 Django hosting service。那么我很高兴可以请到 James 今天来到这里，跟我们来一起分享。他在使用 Django 开发网络服务和网络呃应用程式的经验和心得，好，以及他对整个 Web 开发啊、呃、这些技术上面的一些看法和洞见。好，那 Let us well welcome James to the podium. Before I start, I've、uh, been asked to change the resolution of the screen. So let me just、uh, quickly do that. Actually, it looks like I am sending it at 800 by 600. It's not, I'm not sending it. I, yeah, I thought it was too high resolution. You said. Still saying it's sending it. Hmm. There we go. Let me. There we go. Yep. I'll let him tell me. Well, first of all, thank you very much to all of you for having me here. It's certainly a great honour to be here at、uh, PyCon Taiwan. I also got to experience my very first earthquake this morning, which was a little bit of excitement for me.、Um, I've been working with Python and the web together for uh, about uh, 15 years. I've been working with the web for longer than that. And I want to talk today a bit about Python in general,、uh, quite a bit about the web in general, and how it's changed over the years.、Uh, but I also want to obviously talk about how the two work together, Python and the web.、Uh, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Eldarian.、Uh, we build websites using Python and Django in particular. Uh, we have a hosting service called Gondor, but we also build、uh, sites like Type War, Quisition, Habitualist, as well as a number of、uh, sites for clients. But I'm not going to talk about any of those today.、Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about Python 
and the web. Now, when you hear the word and in logic, and sort of means the intersection. So you might think that I'm going to talk about just the intersection between Python and the web. But I actually want to talk a bit about Python in general and about the web in general. So if I was to draw a diagram, it would probably look more like this. Now, those of you who uh, know your logic would look at that and say, well, isn't that an or? Isn't that Python or the web? Well, I could have called my talk Python or the web, but the problem with that is, I don't know if this is true in Chinese, but in English, when somebody says or, they don't actually mean a logical or. Normally, they mean something more like an exclusive or. Um, so that would suggest that I'm going to talk either about Python or the web, but not both. Um, but that's not what I, <laughs> what I want to do. I want to talk about everything. So perhaps it's easiest to say not in English, uh, but actually to say in Python. The best way to describe this is to say that Python will be in my talk and the web will be in my talk. Now, when I was thinking about Python and the web, um, I was thinking about their histories together. Uh, Python didn't start off being about the web, and the web didn't start off being about Python by any means. But they actually have a very similar history. And if you look at some of the dates, for example, it was back in 1989 that Tim Berners-Lee wrote the first proposal at CERN, his idea for what would become the World Wide Web. But 1989 was also the year that Guido Van Rossum started on Python. 1994 was when the web really started to take off. It was the first World Wide Web conference. Uh, the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, was founded. But guess what? It was also the year that Python 1.0 came out. And then 1997 was when uh, the very first version of, of uh, Python that I used came out, uh, Python 1.5. It was probably the first version that a, a lot of people uh, first started on. That was kind of the inflection point when, when Python really started taking off. Uh, 1997 was also uh, the year that the first XML, uh, sorry, the first HTML specification that came out of the W3C was published. Another interesting correlation between the two is both of them were started by people in Europe who then moved to the northeast of the United States. So it's interesting some of the similarities between the two. Uh, but I want to start off talking a bit about Python in general. And the main message I want to get across is that one of the great things about doing web uh, development in Python, perhaps the greatest thing about doing web development in Python, is that Python can be used for so much more than just web development. I mean, we saw that in, in all of the talks uh, yesterday. We're going to see it again in, in, in talks today. That it's because Python is so versatile and can be used in so many different areas that gives it a huge uh, advantage when doing web development with Python. Now, that versatility of Python starts with the whole batteries included approach that Python takes with the standard library. There are an incredible number of things that you can do out of the box with Python just with a standard library. Uh, but of course, People have built tremendous uh, amounts of additional components that can be used uh, with Python, and, and Python has been applied to so many different areas. Uh, a tremendous amount of use of, of Python is in scientific areas. We heard about a lot of these uh, yesterday. Uh, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, um, Pandas. These are all examples where Python has been applied um, to uh, in, in, in most of these cases, scientific, very data-driven areas. Um, and in particular, in these, uh, there's a lot of use of Python by people that aren't necessarily developers. Um, but Python has turned out to be an excellent language enabling scientists, uh, financial analysts, and, 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 and many other types of people to build the things that they want to build quickly. Another thing that was mentioned yesterday was the Natural Language Toolkit, NLTK, an example where Python is being used to teach natural language processing and actually do natural language processing as well. So Python gets used a lot in, in 
in language and linguistics. Also music, there's a project at MIT called Music, uh, music 21. Um, I also am working on a number of music related open source projects. So my point in, in mentioning all these is that there's so many different things that uh, Python could be used for. If you take some other language that may be a specialist language just for the web, you're not going to get any of those uh, tie-ins, those uh, connections with other things that you can do with the same language. Uh, some other things I want to point out that I think make, uh, make Python particularly great um, from the point of view of, of uh, components that are available. Um, the Sphinx documentation system, um, which a lot of projects now use to write their documentation in, um, really is a tremendous advantage that, that Python gives you the ability to, to write documentation, to produce web versions of that documentation, PDFs of that documentation, and, and so on. Um, it's really a great tool uh, for Python in general. With a, you know, no matter what you're using Python for. And there's a great website, readthedocs.org, that I, I recommend all of you look at. It's a, a, site, a site for hosting your Sphinx documentation. And a lot of open source projects now, people will write their documentation. Documentation is highly valued in the Python community. And uh, Read the Docs can host that documentation for you and make it fully searchable and, and so on. Uh, another area that I think um, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done here um, around packaging and distribution of packages in, in, in Python. Travis mentioned that it's, it's not a solved problem yet by any means. Um, but the Python package index does go a long way towards providing a way of finding Python packages. I also wanted to point out crate.io, which is a new website um, actually developed by a, a, um, a colleague of mine, uh, Don Stuffed that's taking a, a, a sort of modern uh, approach to the Python packaging index. It's built from scratch on, on, on Django, and it's a great way to find Python packages and, and download them. One of the points that Travis made yesterday was um, that you can't use a specialist language to build a system. One of the problems with something like R or MATLAB or something that's only applicable to a specific domain is that once you want to connect that to something else, if you want to bring in data from other sources, if you want to build a user interface, if you want to integrate with other systems, um, if all you're dealing with is a language that's just specific to your domain, um, it's a lot more difficult. One of the great things about Python is that you do have that domain uh, specific components um, but you also have domain-specific components for other domains. You have and all the, all the web stuff and, and so on. So I think Python is unusual in that it is a language that actually appeals to a variety of different types of developers. It appeals to the hardcore computer scientists. It appeals to the domain experts who just want to get work done. And Python, uh, again, as Travis said yesterday, doesn't get in their way. Um, it enables them to very quickly uh, implement what they need to implement. Um, but Python is also appealing to system administrators, people that are actually managing servers and so on, are increasingly using Python as the language that they uh, manage servers with. And of course, the, the topic of this talk, web developers, um, Python is increasingly becoming a language that, that web developers like to use. Uh, just in closing, one of the, in, in the Python section, um, one of the things that has always made Python appealing to me is how much it values the readability of code. Uh, Don Knuth, the American computer scientist, uh, once said, programs are meant to be read by humans and only incidentally for computers to execute. And unlike a lot of other languages that um, tend to celebrate being clever, uh, or even sometimes being obscure. You'll often see people uh, try to write programs in Perl or see that they deliberately try to make it as difficult as possible to understand what's going on. Uh, in the Python community, we love code that's easy to understand uh, so that others can read it, but also you, when you go back to read it, 
in, uh, in many months' time find it easy, easy to read. And I, I, ultimately, for me, that's the thing that uh, makes Python most enjoyable for me, whether I'm using it for the web or something else. So let's talk a little bit about the web. Um, the web has changed dramatically uh, in the 20 years that, uh, that I've been using it. It's, it's funny to think back. When, when I first started using the web, the web was just a small part of the internet. It was just one of many information services, they were called, internet information services. So you had things like email and FTP and Gopher and the web was just one small, tiny little thing. You could download this thing called a browser and it let you get to a few sites. Um, but obviously, uh, it, things really took off to the extent that now the web is the primary way, that the primary thing that most people think of uh, when they think of uh, the internet. Even things like email now, are primarily accessed uh, via a web interface um, for, for many people. So at the heart, right, when Tim Berners-Lee uh, came up with the concept of the web, there were really three components to that, three things involved. One was a markup language, HTML, for uh, describing the structure of documents. Uh, HTTP, a protocol for retrieving documents. And perhaps most significantly, uh, URLs, this way of basically addressing um, some content on the web and then being able to access that via HTTP. Now in the early days, the web was mostly serving up static files. People put files on disk and a, a web server um, would, would serve them up via the protocol. Um, and that's what things were like in, in the, the early 90s. Um, then with the development of, of new browsers like Mosaic, which came out in 1993, um, what was to become Netscape, uh, new features like images got added. Um, I still remember the first time I saw a web page with an image. It was, it was a surprising thing, because up until that point, it had all been text, and to all of a sudden see an image in a, in a, uh, in a browser was quite an incredible thing. I actually remember the, very, the first document I saw on the web that had an image was a guide to uh, lock picking that somebody at MIT had written. Um, that was the sort of thing that was on the, the web back then, I guess. Uh, some of the other developments that came around that time were cascading style sheets, CSS, for making a separation between describing the structure of a document and what that document was to look like. But up until that point, other than CSS, which sort of let you decouple what your page looked like from describing the structure of it, there wasn't really much more that you did other than write, uh, write web pages with a text editor, save them to disk, and they'd get served up. The first uh, notion of reuse that came about was uh, something called server-side includes that if you had a common nav bar on all of your sites or you had a common footer on all of your sites, what you could do is inside your HTML, you could put a comment that said, basically import a fragment of HTML from over here and put it in this page. And uh, web servers like Apache would look at the HTML, would find those kind of comments and pull in um, the server side includes. The thing that really changed everything from just being about publishing documents to being about interfacing with other systems uh, was something called the Common Gateway Interface, or CGI. And CGI was a really simple idea. What it basically said was, if you write a program in whatever language you want, if it can read things in from your uh, operating system environment and it can print stuff out then you can hook it up to a web server, and when a request is made to that web server, your program will be run. It will be given a certain environment. It's to do its thing, and it's to send back whatever is to be sent back to the browser. And that's the way CGI worked, and it was the way that a lot of dynamic, interactive websites were built um, for, for many, many years. Even to this day, there are still sites out there that use CGI as a really simple way of getting uh, a program to connect to a web server. 
so that you can do stuff rather than just uh, present documents. Another big innovation was, uh, so when CGI started, you would, you would write scripts and the scripts would uh, do something and they would print out a bit of HTML and they would do something and they would print out a bit of HTML. So your code became this strange mix of, uh, you know, say, Perl code with little bits of uh, HTML in, in between. And what things like PHP and ASP did was they flipped that around, they reversed it, so that what you would actually do is you would write HTML and occasionally in your HTML you would have a bit of code. Um, in the case of PHP, it was a new language um, that was developed uh, that based on, on Perl um, and some ideas from C. In the case of ASP, it was um, uh, Visual Basic. But that really st uh, started this whole uh, move towards much more interactive uh, sites um, that you could actually do things with rather than just uh, read content. And so we started to see all these database-backed websites where there was a database containing information that was being accessed via a web interface. And most of these sites were, were built around a, a stack that was referred to as LAMP, L-A-M-P, um, because most of them ran on Linux, most of them ran Apache. Um, for the database, most of them used uh, MySQL, MySQL. And the majority of them used uh, PHP or Perl or some of them Python. It's uh, lucky that those three languages all start with P because it means that you can use the term LAMP to refer to all three of them. Um, but PHP was, was a predominant one. Um, Perl was very big uh, for, for this in the, in the 90s. Um, I think that's largely uh, died away now. But that's all to do with uh, doing processing on the server. Um, along came JavaScript. And, and the interesting thing about JavaScript was JavaScript was originally intended to be run on the server. It was developed by Netscape in the mid-90s. It was originally called LiveScript. And it was supposed to be run in the Netscape uh, web server. And uh, then they got the idea, well, what if we actually put that into the browser as well? So the browser could do some computation. The browser could run some scripts. And uh, because of the popularity of, of Java at the time, uh, they decided it, it wouldn't be good if it was described as being like Java, so they changed the name to, to JavaScript, uh, much to the annoyance of a lot of people in the Java community because the two don't really have anything to do with each other at all. Um, so then you had a situation where browsers could do a certain amount of, of computation and calculation on the browser side. The server could do stuff as well. Um, and it led to the question of, well, how do you then communicate between the two? Because no longer are you writing a document in HTML, a static document that just gets served up to the browser. Now you have stuff that can go on in the browser. You have stuff that can go on in the server and the two um, might need to communicate with one another. Now, at the time, um, there was something else going on um, which became relevant to that question I just asked, but uh, it was uh, created for a very different purpose, um, and that was XML. XML came about um, mostly out of the publishing, the electronic publishing industry, um, they wanted a way of being able to write documents independent of whether those documents were going to go on the web or whether those documents were going to be printed. Um, and so a, a group of us, and I was one of the people involved, uh, set about um, uh, working on a, a markup language that would let you describe, uh, describe things um, that could then be uh, formatted for the web or formatted for print. And that's, that's how XML got started. Uh, what happened, though, was the people that were interested in solving the earlier question that I mentioned of how do browsers and uh, servers uh, talk back to one another with, with data, um, some people looked at XML and said, well, maybe XML can solve that problem. And so that's what led to uh, what in the late 90s were referred to as, as web services, 
Uh, Microsoft, IBM, a bunch of other companies were very big into this. But what it was essentially trying to do is take, uh, to use XML as a data interchange format, not as a document markup language, but for data interchange. Um, and to put, and to use the web as the mechanism for that uh, data interchange. Now, a, a key technology that came out around this time, it started off with Microsoft, um, but now is, is widely used um, by a lot of websites and a lot of different browsers, um, is Ajax. And that's become increasingly important. It was quite difficult to use in the, in the early days um, of the, the late 90s and early 2000s, um, but it's really become a, a predominant way of, of, of doing things now. When Ajax first came out, the X stood for XML. Um, the idea of Ajax is the, the, the first A stands for asynchronous because the idea was that you could have a web page that was loaded and then once, once or, or parts of it were loaded and then components on that web page could asynchronously interact with servers to get new information, to update things on the page and so on. Um, over time, uh, the use of XML for this uh, got replaced uh, by something called JSON. And JSON is now really the predominant way that data is interchanged uh, on the web. Um, XML still gets used uh, in some places, but JSON has really replaced it as a way of getting uh, data from the server to the browser so the browser can do something. But this whole move towards uh, things like Ajax and the use of JSON um, raises a lot of interesting questions about what a web page is and, and what a website is. Because we've moved a long way away now from there just being documents on a server that you access via a browser. There are now m many websites that instead of you visiting lots of different pages, you essentially stay on one page and as you perform different actions on the page, different parts of the page change. A great example of this would be something like Gmail, where when you're navigating around, you're not just going to different pages and retrieving a static document. What's happening is JavaScript is running in your browser, which is making requests um, not to entirely new pages, but asynchronous requests to retrieve bits of JSON that then come back to the browser and uh, get styled and, and put in place. Um, before I get on to talking about uh, specifics of um, Python, I want to give two examples of uh, things that I've built or, or have used that sort of demonstrate this move away from just serving up web pages. So hopefully I'll be able to... Um, I'm seeing something difficult, different on my screen than what you're seeing, which always makes it difficult. Uh, so the first thing uh, I want to show you is this little tool I built uh, earlier this year called Candelabra. Um, and what it lets you do is basically set up various projects that you want to work on and time how long you're uh, working on them. So maybe I say I want to set up a, a project called Keynote and I want to set up, a, say I'm going to work on Django later today. And I can, um, unfortunately, unless I leave this running, you're not going to see the, the timer go, but I can basically turn on and off timers for different projects that I'm working on and, and so record how much time am I spending on, uh, on my keynote, how much time am I spending on Django. Now, I point this out because this is, you may not have noticed this, but this is actually running in a browser. I've turned off the status bar and the, and the uh, address bar and so on. I could, I could turn them back on just to to uh, prove to you that, uh, so if I turn on back the, um, say the tab bar, you can start to see that it is, a, it is indeed a browser. Um, the, I point this out, so the way that this works is it's, it, it's entirely in a, it's a single HTML page, it's all written in JavaScript, the information is actually persisted, so if I, sh if I close down my browser and open it up again, the information will still all be there. It's using something called local storage, which modern browsers support as a way of basically letting, letting you store information on the client side. 
Now, the, the only reason I mention this, it has nothing to do with Python, but it's, it, it also has nothing to do with a web server or, or perhaps what you would normally think of as the web, but it is an application that was built in a browser. And the initial code, the initial HTML and CSS and JavaScript, you, you do access via a URL, um, but the data is stored locally, um, and it sort of gives you a different idea of perhaps what a web application might be. Let me give you another example of that before we move on to uh, Python and, and how Python and the web work together. Um, here is a, a web page that I um, run just to show what open source projects I'm working on at the moment, what their status is, what the last to be updated was. So you can see, you know, it says how many public repositories I have on GitHub. It shows which ones have been uh, updated recently, and it's, it's got a list of various projects. Now, again, what's interesting about this is this is, um, this is a dynamic page in that if I go and change something in GitHub, it'll get changed here. But this is actually being served up as a static HTML page. JavaScript is being used to access an API that GitHub provides. GitHub has an API where if you access particular URLs, you can retrieve back information in JSON. And so I take that JSON and style it, and that's what's generating this page. Again, I just point this out to get you thinking about the way that the web has really changed and what, what, uh, what the definition of a website or a web application is has greatly shifted. Um, and while there's still a lot of the tr more traditional serving up of web pages going on, um, web development involves a whole lot more um, today than, than it used to. Okay, let me see if I can go back to my slides. Okay. So now let me actually talk about Python and the web and how these two uh, great things uh, come together. Um, I, I mentioned before that the P in LAMP um, has always been possible to stand for Python, although in the early days it tended to mean Perl and then PHP. In the late mid to late 90s, there was a, a huge Python project. It's probably one of the Python projects that people first heard about Python because of uh, something called the, the Z ob Object Publishing Environment, or, or ZOPE. And ZOPE was a, a big project to, to provide a, a full stack for um, developing websites. Um, it did all sorts of things like uh, let you actually develop your website via a browser. You could actually set up your content all via a, a web interface and so on. Um, and so it had its own object uh, database behind it, uh, ZODB. And it uh, gave rise to an extremely popular content management system called Plone, which is still extensively in use today. But in a lot of regards, the whole ZOP and Plone uh, approach um, has things have shifted a lot towards a, a much more modular rather than monolithic systems where it's a lot easier to go in and see how individual components uh, work and, and mix and match uh, different components as well. And one of the key things that happened in the Python world to enable that was something called WSGI or the Web Server Gateway Interface. Uh, I remember I mentioned before um, that the very first way that uh, computer programs could uh, provide web pages was through something called CGI, the Common Gateway Interface. Uh, WSGI was really, is really just a standard way of doing that specifically in Python. And, and to do that in a more efficient way, one of the problems with CGI is that every time somebody made a request uh, to, to a, a particular URL, your script would have to be uh, run. And then when it had served up whatever, whoops, sorry, served up whatever page it was going to serve up, the script would stop. Somebody else accessed a page, the script would have to be run again. Um, and particularly in something like Python, there's, there's a delay as the interpreter runs up. You're basically restarting Python 
every time somebody hits a web page. And that's horribly inefficient. And various solutions were developed, fast CGI as a way of sort of keeping Python running um, even when a request wasn't being made and so it was ready when a request was made. Um, but what WSGI did is, is really make it a, a lot more a standard a Python, Pythonic way of, uh, of building web applications. And now pretty much all of the web frameworks, um, some of which I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, now use WSGI. So, and then web servers uh, like uh, Apache, GUnicorn and, and, and so on uh, support WSGI so that the web server doesn't need to know about the particular Python web framework you're using. And that's really done wonders for um, the ability for people to use Python on the web. So in the, starting around 2003, 2004, we started really seeing the rise of web frameworks that were based around a model view controller pattern, an MVC pattern. And there are still many of these around, not just in Python, everything from um, you know, Ruby on Rails um, in the Ruby world to struts in the, in, the, in, in the Java world and so on. There are many of these uh, web frameworks in the last 10 years that adopt this uh, model view controller framework. And in the context of web frameworks, what that basically means is you have some mapping to a database, a relational database typically, um, although you know, that, that certainly is, is changing. Um, but traditionally, MVC meant a, a relational database. Some sort of HTML templating language, um, similar to what we saw uh, in the early days with PHP and ASP, where you had uh, HTML with little bits of, of code in it, although a much cleaner separation so that the, the logic as much of the business logic as possible was kept out of the template and the only logic that you had in your HTML template was display logic. And then finally, request routing. When a request comes in, how do you map that URL to some bit of code that's going to call the database, pull data out, uh, use an HTML template to, to render HTML to send back to the browser? So a few... Um, few different approaches in the Python world that, uh, or different projects that took the uh, MVC approach. Um, the first version of, of Turbo Gears used something called SQL object as the uh, object relational mapper, something called KID as a templating language, and, and then Cherry Pie as, as, as the controller. Um, Turbo Gears took the approach, unlike Django, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a moment, um, TurboGears took the approach of trying to take um, an existing third-party uh, solution for each of these different areas. It took an existing object relational mapping tool, it took an existing templating language, an existing um, routing, and, and integrated them together. Um, the TurboGears 2 took the same approach, but it used a different choice for each of those uh, slots in the MVC pattern. So it used SQL Alchemy as an object relational uh, mapping, Genshi as a templating language, and, and Pylons as the way of doing the, uh, the request routing. Um, although I haven't used it extensively, because I, I primarily use Django, uh, SQL Alchemy is an amazing, uh, probably the, the best example in Python of an object relational uh, mapping, or object relational mapper. So if you're doing anything involving it doesn't even need to be web-based. If, if you're wanting to interact with relational databases and Python objects, and particularly if it's an existing database that you need to map back, back and forth with Python, um, I highly recommend uh, taking a look at SQL Alchemy, even if you're not uh, using it in the context of, of the web. But SQL Alchemy is what TurboGears uh, 2 used. Um, within the, the, the Zope world, uh, there was something being worked on called Repose BFG, um, and recently the Repose BFG folk and the Pylons people have combined uh, forces to work on something called Pyramid. Um, so Pyramid is another uh, project in the in the Python world um, for 
for doing websites that's focused primarily not on the, you still need to add a uh, object relational mapper, you need to add a templating language, but for gluing all those together, um, Pyramid is a, another uh, project that exists for that. Uh, another example of a project that tries not to do everything but instead tries to uh, combine uh, existing components um, is, is Flask. Flask is unusual in that it's a, it's a web framework that started off as an April Fool's joke. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the concept of, of April Fool's, but in, in the Western world there's this crazy tradition that on the 1st of April you make an announcement that's a complete lie and see how many people you can trick into thinking it's actually a real announcement. And uh, all sorts of crazy things have been proposed. Um, Google once proposed that they were going to build a, 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 a base on the moon. Um, and so they did a press release and big announcement, but it was April, April 1st. Um, but sometimes April, 1st April Fool's announcements are actually uh, real. Uh, famously, Google announced Gmail on April 1st. And at the time, the existing mail services, this is just a little aside, it's nothing to do with Flask, but you'll see why in a moment I, I mention this, but before Gmail came along, uh, so there were free mail services, like uh, Yahoo had one, and they, they provided just a few megabytes of mail for free. On April 1st, Google announced that they were going to give people a gigabyte of free mail. And it seemed so crazy, it was April 1st, everyone thought, ha ha, this is a funny joke that Google's playing. And then people started thinking, well, hang on a sec, maybe they could do that. Maybe that is something that's affordable, and guess what? When April 2nd came along, Gmail still existed, and it still exists today. Um, so it was an example of an April Fool's joke that uh, turned out not to be a joke. Uh, Flask is somewhere in the middle. It actually was supposed to be a joke when it came out. It was, co it was called, um, it wasn't called Flask, it was called Denied, I think it was called. But um, Armin Ranica, the, the creator of Flask, uh, tried to come up with what he thought was the simplest possible uh, web framework. That was kind of his joke. And it actually turned out people liked it. So he developed it a little further and it became, it became Flask. Um, Armin had written a, earlier written his own templating language uh, called Ginger. Um, he'd, the later version of that, Ginger 2, was what he used in, in Flask. Flask often gets described as a micro web framework rather than a full-blown web framework like uh, Turbo Gears or, or Django because Flask is really just doing the core. It's providing the glue between a WSGI request coming in and you sending something back out. And you need to plug in something like SQL Alchemy if you want to talk to a relational database, or Ginger if you want to uh, render templates and, and so on. But that appeals to a lot of people. Certainly Flask gives you the most flexibility if you don't have a relational database if you have some other kind of data source or if you are wanting to do quite a different approach to, uh, to rendering. But the framework that I'm most familiar with um, is, is Django and unlike um, Turbo Gears which integrates a lot of uh, existing things or Flask which tries to just provide a very small amount and you add in what you need, uh, Django tries to provide a lot more for you out of the box. It has its own templating language, it has its own object relational mapping. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to doing everything uh, in the one stack. Um, certainly, if you want to get going quickly, you know, Django's approach makes that possible. Um, but if you want to do something that's particularly unusual, Django might get in your way a little more, might make it a little more difficult. But Django is certainly the most popular web framework in the Python world at the moment. Um, many of you have probably heard of Instagram, um, a photo sharing site that was recently acquired by Facebook. Um, Instagram is built with Django, um, another big site with many millions of users that's uh, become popular in the last few months is, is Pinterest, another site that's built in Django. So, Django and, of course, by extension, Python, are being used in, in very big, uh, serious websites. 
Um, Django recently had a, a 1.4 release. Um, Django had its first release in 2008. Well, it's first, it's 1.0 release, I shouldn't say it's first release. Django was first released in 2005 and had an extremely long uh, series of 0.9 releases. It had a 0.90 release and a 0.91 release and a 0.95 release and a 0.96 release. And years went by between each of those. But 1.0 came out in 2008. 1.4 just came out earlier this year. Um, some of the new things that, that came out in, in Django 1.4 uh, were much better support uh, for time zones. For those of you familiar with uh, SQL, the ability to do a, a, a select for update so you can update uh, rows in, in the same query as, as, um, as actually d doing a query. Before this, you had to do a query to find out what data you wanted to modify, then modify it and save it again, which was a lot more inefficient. Um, a lot better password hashing, signed cookies, a lot of security things. Um, a much more uh, out-of-the-box experience with WSGI, some uh, project app templates, and uh, better support for in-browser testing. So I just want to finish up um, talking about a project that I've been working on for uh, the last four years, uh, something called Pinax, which is really a layer above Django. And we've talked a lot about these whole, this whole MVC approach and, and whether you're comparing Turbo Gears to Django or Flask, there's, they're largely sitting at the same level, solving those MVC type problems. Um, what the Pinax problem is, uh, pro project is trying to do is solve a, a, a different problem, a layer on top. Before we get into that though, I want to talk a little bit about why we layer things in software to start with. Um, one reason is the portability of higher layers. Um, one of the things that Django does, for example, is it layers um, the database, the object relational mapping, is a layer on top of a series of database specific uh, backends. So when you're using Django, you don't necessarily care if you're using Postgres or MySQL, you're largely isolated from that. And it means that code that you write that's going to run on a site that's running on Postgres, unless you're doing something Postgres specific, can easily be moved to something that's it's using uh, MySQL. So you're getting portability because you've layered the, the database access in that way. But another reason for doing layering is the reusability of the lower layers. When you build a site, you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every time. You don't want to have to build your own templating language and your own database object relational mapping and your own URL routing. So you often use a framework uh, to do that because chances are most sites that you build are going to have very similar requirements in terms of templating and, and uh, object relational mapping and, and so on. So you can build that solution once or someone else can build it for you and, um, and you can reuse that again and again on different sites. And that's going to become really important um, for explaining what, what Pinax is. There is another reason. Um, I mentioned the uh, computer scientist Don Knuth earlier. Um, Don Knuth is, is probably most famous for a series of books called The Art of Computer Programming that are sort of the books on computer algorithms. And they're quite difficult to understand, um, extremely rewarding if you can understand them, but um, they're quite difficult to understand. And um, Tim Peters, one of the uh, main contributors to Python, um, who contributed a lot of stuff to both the core of Python and the Python standard library, um, in the introduction to the Python cookbook, um, says, we read Knuth so you don't have to. What he means by that is um, he's gone and, and looked at all the algorithms that Knuth has come up with and described in the art of computer programming and then implemented them in Python so you don't need to understand them, you can just use them. And it's another huge advantage of layering is that you can make use of things that have been developed by people that know a lot more about the subject than you do. 
Um, one of the big uh, things, not only all these sort of algorithms that Tim Peters is talking about, but security is another big thing. Um, if I had to worry about all the different ways that websites could be uh, compromised, I would probably not get any web development done at all. But instead, communities like the Django community have people that are experts in web security. They understand which hashing algorithms are better than others for passwords and why you really need to cryptographically sign your cookies and, and so on. They build that, they build it into Django, so Django has that out of the box, and I can get on with the job of building websites, which is what I really want to do. So at the end of the day, all of this is about trying to get more quickly from an idea you have for a website to the realization of that idea. Um, Seth Godin, uh, American businessman, um, point, has pointed out in a, in a talk to a, a bunch of web developers that what you do for a living is, is not be creative, what you do is ship. What he means is the point of what you do as a web developer is actually create websites. If you're not, if you're not actually d delivering the website, you've, you've failed. So, um, Pinax is a project that I've been involved in for four years to, to try to make uh, that a little easier. What it tries to do is build a lot of the common components on top of Django that you would otherwise find yourself building again and again. Um, things like user sign-up and, and management, um, components like comments or voting or rating, um, integration with things like Twitter and Facebook. All those sorts of things that a lot of websites use that aren't necessarily the core of the website that you're building, but if they didn't exist in something like Pinax, you would have to build them again and again. So Pinax provides um, some default templates, some reusable apps, um, some starter projects to, to, to get you going, and then this increasing collection of all sorts of, of different um, components that can be used in different websites. Um, so just to finish up, one of the things that I want to point out is that the web now involves a lot more than even just the database and the code that you write in, in Python or whatever. Um, some of the stuff that I haven't uh, really touched on that pretty much get used by most uh, medium to large websites nowadays is some form of caching, uh, some, some form of, of full text search, um, things like message queues, and Python and, and web frameworks in Python all have great ways of incorporating these into your, into your website. Um, you know, Django has excellent uh, integration with various caching uh, products like Redis. Um, there's something called Haystack, which does a tremendous job of, of providing full text search into Solar and, and other search engines. And another uh, Python project, Celery, um, gives you a way of using message queues and so on when you've got long-running tasks that you want to, um, to run asynchronously um, outside of the request response cycle. Um, but just a couple of other things I want to point out um, in this changing world of the web and what role Python might play uh, that go outside of just this idea of serving up web pages. Um, one thing that increasingly gets done uh, is just providing web APIs. It's entirely possible that you could build with Python and a web framework like Flask or Django something that doesn't actually serve up web pages, it just provides an API that gets consumed by clients of, of other kinds. Um, or some, in some cases, build a website that also has an API. You saw before when I gave the example of the, the web page that shows the open source projects um, that I work on on GitHub. That's an example where it's using an API provided by GitHub. GitHub isn't serving up any HTML. It's just serving up JSON. Um, now, GitHub is, is, is using a Ruby on Rails for that, but there's no reason why you can't use a Python web framework to do exactly the same thing. And, uh, you know, for example, one of uh, the things my company's done is we've built some um, iOS apps for iPhone and iPad where there's a server running, and it's running Django, and it's providing an API that iPhone and iPad are connecting to. Um, so you don't necessarily think of that as a, it's not a website, but we're using a web framework 
we're serving up an API via web technologies. Um, another example of that that's, that uses Python is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dropbox, which is a, a sort of file storage in the cloud. Um, it's built with Python. Um, so it's providing a service that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a website. Um, and then there's the other side, consuming web APIs. Uh, Python has a number of libraries, both in the standard library and outside, for consuming uh, web APIs. So you could pull in stuff um, via an API. So just in closing, the main message I want to get across is that Python is a great language for the web because it's a great language in general, um, and that the web uh, is becoming increasingly uh, complex and there's so many uh, different parts to it, um, but that Python is uh, can be an extremely important component in the overall web. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we can have several questions for James. Yes, please. Thank you for your very informative uh, presentation. Um, recently, I heard about many times uh, about the buzzword, HTML5. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems that you haven't mentioned about it. Could you uh, give some comment about that? Sure. HTML5. So, um, HTML5 is uh, really just a term for all of the new stuff that browsers have been supporting uh, over the last couple of years. There's a very interesting interaction that happens between the people that make the web browsers and the people that write the specifications of you know, what, what HTML is and what uh, CSS is and, and so on. And sometimes the standards bodies are ahead and sometimes the browser makers are ahead. Um, what happened sort of historically, there was a tremendous amount of innovation in web browsers in the mid-90s, mostly between mid to late 90s, mostly between Microsoft and Netscape. And when it became clear that um, Internet Explorer beat Netscape, not much changed for a, a number of years. There wasn't really much innovation on the browser side of things. And then we started to see, you know, Firefox came out and the WebKit project, which is behind both Safari and Chrome. And in the last few years, we've all of a sudden seen a lot more innovation, people uh, really making browsers more and more uh, advanced. That example I gave of Candelabra, the timing, the timer thing that I, that I built, the fact that it can store data on the client side is a feature of these new browsers. Um, and HTML5 is, is the term that's used for, so HTML, HTML changed, has, has sort of progressed, but uh, JavaScript has gotten better, CSS has gotten better, there's these new browser features like local storage, and all of those together are generally what gets referred to as, as, as HTML5. So it, it's a big innovation in the browser, um, and I certainly think all web developers should be uh, uh, trying to take advantage of, uh, of HTML5, although it doesn't really change that much what you do with Python on the, on the server side. So uh, can Python uh, play a role or somewhat uh, about uh, HTML5? Can Python uh, play a role in such a, a scenario? Absolutely, absolutely. Because most, I mean, most of the websites that, that my company builds use HTML5 technologies and use Python and Django to, to serve them up. HTML5 doesn't really, HTML5 is just providing um, some new features that you can take advantage of on the, in the browser. But the actual uh, applications that you build, if you, if you need a, something on the server side, you're still, uh, you can still build all that with, with Python. Hi, 
uh, James, it's Tommy. Tony, okay. Uh, my question, uh, currently uh, jQuery is very popular. Mm -hmm. And how to use jQuery to cooperate with uh, Django to take advantage? Yeah, so jQuery is what we use on all of our websites as well. For those of you who may not be familiar with jQuery, um, one of the struggles that people had using uh, JavaScript for a long time was not so much a problem with JavaScript, but the way in which you accessed and manipulated HTML from JavaScript. So if you're building a dynamic website where you're doing things on the client side written in JavaScript, you need to be able to add new bits of HTML and, and style different bits of HTML. And the API that was provided by most browsers was quite difficult to use. And so this thing called jQuery um, came along. Um, and jQuery lets you access the HTML DOM um, using a syntax that looks a lot like uh, CSS selectors. Um, and it's largely separate from what you choose to do on the server side. Um, as long as, so what we do a lot is, um, in the sites we build is, we'll use jQuery um, to do the stuff on the client side. Um, either, jQuery makes it really easy to, to pull stuff using Ajax, so it could pull JSON that then gets styled on the client side, or it could pull fragments of HTML. Um, whether it's JSON or HTML coming from the server, we're using Django to to produce that. So Django is, is you know, pulling stuff from the database. It's constructing either JSON or HTML fragments. It's sending it back to some code that's using jQuery to then manipulate the web page. So the two work very well together. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, what would be the best approach to integrate um, SSL layer and the subdomain with Django? Uh, so there's a, um, depends exactly what you need to do, what, what you're wanting to do with um, subdomains, but uh, for the SSL question, um, there is, well, to a certain extent, you can just use SSL without Django even necessarily knowing that you're using it. Um, you can just, on your front end uh, web server, uh, provide SSL. But there's a great Django app called Django Secure, and it adds some nice things like, one of the things you want to do when you're using SSL is you want to make sure that if somebody accesses your website at HTTP, you want it to redirect to HTTPS. You want to make sure that cookies are only sent via HTTPS. You want to make sure that there's all sorts of little things that you want to do. If you're using SSL, you want to use it properly. And so this app, Django Secure, lets you very easily add that capability to your Django site. Um, for subdomain stuff, I presume you mean that you want to get a different, you want to have a single Django site, but depending on what subdomain the person visits, they get different content? Is that sort of thing? Yeah. So um, there's a number of ways you can, a uh, number of different solutions. There's a app called, I think it's called Django Sites, which what it basically does is it takes the subdomain that you're wanting to access and makes that available in all your views. So any queries you want to do, um, you have that bit of information available. So you can filter your queries differently or, or uh, show a different, uh, render a different template or whatever, depending on what, um, what subdomain. So yeah, Django Sites and Django Secure. How about um, multiple domain with one like Django application? Well, that's what, that's what that would, would give. Oh, multiple domains completely. I think that will solve the same problem. Yeah, because from Django's point of view, it, all it cares about was what was the full host name. So if, if they have the same IP address, whatever, if, they go, if they're going to the same Django instance, then as long as your views know what the site name, well, the host name was, it can uh, act differently. And there's another right. question Thank you. there, right? Yeah, 
please. I'm around for the rest of the day, so you can always come and grab me afterwards. We can only allow one more question, or you will have to uh, sacrifice a refreshment. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have a question about in traditional web, the client have the request to the <laughs> server and the server responds some data to the client. Uh, but after the Node.js and WebSocket appears, server can send data to the client without the client sending request. But can Django do anything like this? Um, I, certainly out of the box it doesn't. I, I suspect there are probably some apps that support WebSocket. Um, but I haven't used any, any myself. I haven't, I've not done much with, with WebSockets. Um, although they certainly do uh, serve a particular use. Um, I've never had to build a site that's really needed web sockets as opposed to uh, polling on the on the client side. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head of of a particular um, solution. But I'm the challenge is that um, Django is normally not executing code unless you're making a request. So. The only way you would get um, the that you would be able to execute code on the server side that is making the um, the WebSocket request is if you had some something like Celery or something that was that was executing regularly because it's 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 based on well actually that's that's I should correct myself there it depends what's triggering the event that's going to send to the WebSocket. If it's something another user has done, then it's quite easy for Django to do. So in other words, if, if you go to your web browser and you send me a message and I'm supposed to get a notification via a WebSocket, that's fairly easy to do in Django because I can do it in the same code that's handling, you know, it, Django code got called when you sent the message. Um, if it's something else going on like, um, I want to send a WebSocket when an alarm goes off or a certain time is reached, then you'd need something additional to Django like Celery or something that's running all the time, even if there's no uh, request being made. But it's, it's, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly possible, um, but you would need something in addition to Django in order to uh, support sending messages if there's nothing going on on the website to trigger it. Okay, I think we have to stop, stop here. And uh, I believe you have a lot of more questions. You can take it offline and uh, ask to James later on. So let us thank James again. So right now we have refreshment ready outside. <laughs>